hello, and Shana Tova, or Happy New Year to our Jewish siblings. We want to welcome you to our second in a five-part Facts Over Fear webinar series. Wherever we may be, I want to acknowledge that in the United States, we are on tribal land. My name is Anila Afzali, and I'm the Executive Director of the American Muslim Empowerment Network at the Muslim Association of Puget Sound. I'm a recovering attorney, and I left my legal career in 2013 after a spiritual transformation brought me back to my faith. Since then, I've been working on bridge building and justice advocacy, including starting the Facts Over Fear series with my dear brother and partner in good, Reverend Terry Kylo, who I'll pass it on to in just a moment. The Facts Over Fear series consists of five animated videos that we created to address the myths and misconceptions about Islam and Muslims. If you missed last week's session, which provided an overview of the Islamophobia industry, you can catch the live stream on our Facts Over Fear Facebook page or on our YouTube and website. And this week, we are looking at Islam and what it actually teaches about peace and physical confrontation. To get us started, I'm going to pass it over to Reverend Terry. Thank you, Anila, and welcome, everyone. We're so happy to have you with us. We'll be uh, having this webinar until about you know 5.15 or so Pacific time, so about an hour and 15 minutes or so. But we'll be happy to stay on for an extra 15 or 20 minutes and answer any questions. Uh, it's really important for you to, to know that, um, that the main way for you to ask questions is using the Q&A feature. And all of us uh, as panelists will be able to see that tonight. So again, my name is Terry Kylo. I'm a Lutheran pastor and have been serving for nearly 30 years in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And about uh, five years ago, I felt very strongly a call as, as both a Christian, but also as an American citizen and as a human being to stand with my American Muslim neighbors uh, because really um, any dehumanization toward any group dehumanizes all of us and makes our society less safe and less prosperous. And I just felt a deep call to do that. And I'm so happy to stand with Anila and Race, who we're going to introduce later, and all of my Muslim friends that I've come to know over the last five years, and who've helped me reaffirm my own humanity and even my own faith. So we have these five videos that Anila and I produced um, a, a few years ago, actually a year ago now. And we'd like to show you the, first, the one tonight on Islam and peace. So let me share my screen and we'll, uh, we'll get that going. Islam envisions a cycle of peace. Human beings at peace with the Creator and all that God has created. Islam calls on people to love their neighbors, communities to respect others, governments to foster justice for everyone. But sometimes human beings refuse God's call or communities act in fear of others or governments act unjustly. Every faith tradition calls us to peace and inspires us to new beginnings when we fall short. But what about those who justify their violence by their religion? A young man belonged to a faith community but was radicalized online. He wrote a manifesto, killed nine people, and wanted to inspire others to continue a cycle of violence, claiming God was on his side. Dylan Roof was a Christian. We know his terrible actions do not reflect what Jesus taught because we know Christians. We don't trust the KKK to speak for Jesus. We should not let criminals speak for Islam. Instead, we should look to the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad and the Quran. The Prophet Muhammad said, you will not enter paradise until you believe and you will not believe until you love each other. Shall I show you something that, if you did, you would love each other? Spread peace between yourselves. Likewise, the Quran teaches Muslims how to respond when they are harmed. The good deed and the evil deed are not equal. Repel evil by that deed which is better, and thereupon the one who is an enemy will become as though he was a devoted friend. The Quran further asserts a powerful message about the oneness of humanity and the mandate to do good. O oh, humankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and a female, and made you into nations and tribes that ye may get to know each other, and not that ye may despise each other. Verily, the most honored of you in the sight of God is the one who is the most righteous of you. 
Violence exists among people in all traditions. It is a human problem. Amplified in the world today because of colonialism, power dynamics, politics and foreign policies, hopelessness, loneliness, and more. The biggest threat of mass violence on U.S. soil is actually from white supremacists, and American Muslims are more likely than other faith groups to reject attacks on civilians. Islam continues to call Muslims to participate in a cycle of peace. As the Prophet Muhammad said, the best of people are those that bring most benefit to the rest of humankind. He further taught that there is a reward for serving any animate living being. Let's work together to answer this call to bring benefit to society and serve humanity together. Please check out our links in the YouTube thank all of you for, for, for sharing that with us. And I just want to encourage you all to really enjoy some time with uh, Anila Afzali, who is my, my friend and my partner in this work. And I've learned so much about being a human being and being an American citizen and being about being a person of faith from her. And so Anila, take it away. Thank you so very much, uh, dear brother Terry. It is always an honor to get to work with you and to be with you together uh, with race today as well. I hope you can see my screen. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so very much. So again, my name is Anil Afzali. Uh, I was born to Muslim parents and raised with Islamic values like honesty, service, integrity, justice, and hard work. But I was really a Ramadan Muslim, practicing my faith during the holy month of Ramadan, much like Christmas Christians or Easter Christians. I was so blessed to be the first in my family to go to college and get a degree. And it was in college that I chose Islam for myself after a comparative analysis of religion. But as I tell people, I chose Islam with my mind at that time, and it hadn't really moved my heart. I continued on to get my law degree from Harvard Law School, which was beyond my dreams even. And it wasn't until after making partner at a law firm and then becoming general counsel of a healthcare IT company that I had a spiritual transformation. And that's when Islam changed my heart and inspired me to make significant changes in my life. Those changes included leaving my legal career with nothing but faith and trust in God in order to pursue service and knowledge, two things that Islam heavily emphasizes. And my desire was to pursue my passions, live out my true purpose in life, and find peace of mind, spirit, and heart. Indeed, Islam comes from the root word for peace, and it means submission to God. The idea is that by submitting our will to God, we achieve peace within ourselves and with the environment and people around us. Muslims believe in all the prophets, including Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, peace be upon them all, we believe they are all Muslims, at least with a lowercase m, because they submitted their will to God. And the Muslim greeting, assalamu alaikum, means peace be upon you. Muslims also close every single prayer, which Muslims are commanded to do at least five times a day, by sending salams or peace to everyone on our right and everyone on our left. And as I was learning more about Islam and practicing the five daily prayers, I was in fact finding peace within myself and with my environment around me. I was becoming a better person. And it wasn't just me. I witnessed that same positive change in my family as well, as they also became more practicing. It was a beautiful change we were living out in our daily lives. We were becoming softer, gentler, kinder, better people. But our lived experience and the actual teachings of Islam that I was learning so much about were in stark contrast to the narrative about Islam and Muslims in media, politics, and popular culture. For the past seven years, I've been working on addressing this divide, on building bridges and getting to know each other and following the sacred teachings of Jesus, peace be upon him, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, and others about loving God and loving our neighbors as ourselves. And I'll be honest and say that without my spiritual transformation, I would not have the patience and strength to do this work. It's my faith that teaches me to act humbly 
and respond with words of peace, even to the ignorant who may drive by and yell obscenities at me, for instance. It is my faith that teaches me to ignore the haters and not, and not let them make me swerve from doing what's right and what's just. It is my faith that teaches me to show mercy and kindness even when people may not deserve it because I want God to show me mercy. And believe me, I've been tested in this. I remember one example in particular, specifically at an anti-Muslim rally. And this was an instance where uh, uh, one of the hate groups, uh, Act for America, organized anti-Muslim rallies across our country. There was one in Seattle as well. And I remember a couple coming up to me and uh, the, the woman in the wheelchair here, on her lap, she had anti-Muslim signs. And she and her husband came to me and they were talking to me and they had all of these misconceptions about what Islam is or what the Quran says. And I was trying uh, to show them what Islam is about and, and to help uh, educate. But I remember sort of the things that they kept repeating. These are things that I hear all the time from people everywhere that, we that the Reverend Terry and I go to. We see it all the time. People unfortunately have such misinformation about what Islam actually teaches or what the Quran says. And I remember holding this woman's hands and talking to her with the love and compassion that we as Muslims are taught to exhibit for humanity. And this is part of the effort to help educate about what Islam actually teaches, not the misinformation that is promoted by the people who will profit from the misinformation campaign. campaign. For example, the emphasis on kindness being a mark of faith in Islam, or on, uh, or on, I'm sorry here, or on service bringing benefit to humanity, as was quoted in the video as well, or doing good, seeking justice, spreading peace, and so much more, similar to the beautiful teachings of other faiths and other wisdom traditions. But there is this intentional misinformation campaign that promotes the false narrative about Islam and Muslims. And this is the Islamophobia industry that we talked about last week. And one of the strongest tools of misconception that they use to promote false information about Islam is violence. They do this by taking an Arabic word, jihad, and attributing their horrible meanings to it and supporting such wrong views with verses from the Quran taken out of context and without understanding. So let's talk about this. First off, it is important to know that the sanctity of life is significant in Islam. The Quran, like the Torah, specifically has a verse talking about how taking one life unjustly is like taking all, all life, and how saving one life is like saving all of humanity. Moreover, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us that a Muslim is one from whom people are safe, physically and verbally. So then what about jihad? Well, jihad means to strive, struggle, and exert effort. It is, in fact, a struggle to do good. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us that the greatest jihad is to battle our own soul, the, the, to fight the evil inclinations and desires within ourselves. This is the major jihad, and it has both individual and societal components. Individually, it includes things like overcoming our own egos, our laziness, refraining from doing wrong, restraining our anger, praying five times a day, fasting during the month of Ramadan, you know, even when we might want food, showing kindness to our parents, and not even saying uff to them, which is actually a command in the Quran. And it is a challenge, I'll tell you that sometimes. <laughs> Societally, it includes things like speaking truth to power, struggling for justice, serving those in need, creating the positive change that we want to see in society, and so much more. There are so many different forms of this, of this jihad, of these kinds of struggles. And it's all, these are all part of the major jihad that every single Muslim, indeed every single human being, has to struggle with in this world. 
that struggle to do good, even as, or especially when we might have the option to not do what's right or good or just. Then there is what Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, himself identified as the minor or lesser jihad. And this is physical confrontation. It is the struggle in the battlefield for self-defense or to fight against tyranny and oppression. It is not supposed to be aggressive action. And this physical struggle, the minor jihad, is only permissible in limited circumstances. The verses in the Quran that speak about fighting and war are in this limited defensive context. But specific verses are often taken out of context, either by critics or hater, haters of Islam when they're discussing jihad, or by misguided Muslims themselves who wish to justify their aggressive tactics. For example, I'll just use one example here, verse 190 in chapter 2 of the Quran. People use this to say, oh, Islam teaches to fight in the cause of God. But if you actually look at the full verse, it says to fight those who fight you and to not transgress limits because God does not love the transgressors. And this whole passage in chapter two, if you understand the context and history, it's about fighting in defense against the Meccan tribe, the Quraysh, who were perpetrators of religious persecution and torture. And the passage clearly prohibits fighting against those who are not fighting. So it's so important to actually read or know sort of the context of different verses, especially when we're talking about religious scripture. Another common misquoted uh, verse is the kill them where you find them verse. And to properly address that, we really need some historical context. And here I will say that Muslims and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were a persecuted minority by the Quraysh, the Arabs in Mecca. They were harassed and tortured for 13 years in Mecca. There was even assassination attempts on the life of Prophet Muhammad, and yet they had no permission by God at that time to fight. So for 13 years they endured, they were finally driven out of their homes, they fled persecution by going and seeking refuge in Medina, where they were welcomed. And the Quraysh then, they seized the property of the Muslims from Mecca, and they started selling those stolen goods. Finally, in the second year in Medina, Muslims were finally granted that permission to even fight against their oppressors. And that's when we had the Battle of Badr where 313 Muslims defeated an army of a thousand soldiers from the Quraysh. After that battle, there were other battles before the Muslims finally were able to enter into a 10-year peace treaty with the Quraysh in the year 628. That treaty allowed Islam to grow peacefully, but unfortunately, the Quraysh violated the terms of the treaty just a couple years later, the year 630. But by this time, the Muslim community had grown to 100,000 and they marched into Mecca where they were able to conquer Mecca mostly peacefully. And Muhammad at that time, when he entered Mecca, even though he was a, 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 war, you know, a, a ruler, a, a prevailing king, he had won. He had his head down in humility, praying to God. And he brought together all these people who had been fighting him from the Quraysh and these people who had killed and tortured not only his followers, but even his own family. And he said to them what Prophet Joseph, peace be upon him, said to his brothers and forgiving them. He said, have no fear this day. Go your way. You are all free. So in that context, revelation came down saying that these criminals, these enemies who had been fighting you all this time, give them four months to think about the faith. Allow them to be in a place of safety so they're not intimidated in any way. And if they choose to accept Islam, great. They become your brothers and sisters and are equal citizens. If they choose to leave, great. They can do that. They can do so peacefully. But if they choose to remain in Mecca and continue fighting you, then kill them wherever you find them. This is not a general policy or something that applies beyond the specific instance there where the messenger of God was present, where a four-month amnesty had been applied and God brought an end to the war between the Muslims and the Quraysh. So without this context, you can manipulate religious texts to support anything you want. And this is, there are two specifically here, uh, two uh, sources, resources that I will share, where you can read more about the mis misquotations from the Quran and uh, a video that explains specifically the, the verse that I just uh, said here. So the verses that allow for physical combat, they're very conditional. 
They're allowed in limited circumstances only and is to defend against aggression or oppression. And even when fighting was allowed in Islam, it came with strict limitations. Just to give you a sense of some of the limitations Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, imposed, even in warfare, you can see some of the specific restrictions there. And beyond that, Islam strongly encourages peace and an end to war. This is confirmed with several verses in the Quran, numerous ones, like the, the following, where it specifically says, if they remove themselves from you and do not fight you, then offer peace because you don't have any right to fight people who are not fighting you. Or this other one, that if they incline to peace, then incline to it also and rely upon God. So the mandate to fight was during a time of desperate struggle for survival that the Muslim community was subjected to by its enemies. And when the danger was over, when Prophet Muhammad had won in Mecca and had power to do as he pleased with his enemies, what did he do? He forgave them and let them go. He even forgave people like Hind, who was the woman who ordered the assassination of Muhammad's beloved uncle. And not only did she order his killing and, and he was killed, but Hind literally cannibalized Prophet Muhammad's uncle, literally eight pieces of his body. That's how vile her behavior was. And yet Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, forgave Hind and accepted her as a sister. That reveals the true essence of Islam, and it's what Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught to his followers, to show forgiveness and kindness even to those who do you wrong, not to show evil, not to do evil. Now, of course, not all Muslims follow the example of Prophet Muhammad or the teachings of Islam, just like not all Christians follow what Jesus, peace be upon him, taught. But there are many Muslims who do actually follow such teachings, and we are so honored to have one such special guest with us today. That is Rais Buyan. Now, Rais is the founder and president of World Without Hate, and he has a powerful personal story that he's going to share with you all. Uh, and it is such an honor to have people like him inspiring everyday Muslims, everyday Americans, all of us to be better, to do better. So I'm going to let him share his own story just because it is so very powerful. Go ahead, Race. Well, thank you so much, Sister Alila, for having me. And, um, you know, uh, the points you all mentioned is so powerful. So I'll be very brief on my story. Um, on September 21st, 2001, I began what would be my last day of work uh, as a store clerk in Southeast Dallas. Around noon that day, a man wearing a bandana, sunglasses, baseball cap, and holding a sort of double barrel shotgun walked in. Pointing the gun directly at my face, he asked me, where are you from? And before I could say anything more than, excuse me, he pulled the trigger from point blank range. Tomorrow is my rebirth day. Tomorrow, September 21st, also International Day of Peace, will mark 19 years since my shooting. There is not a single day that goes by that I am not fully aware of how close I came to death at the hands of hate. On my way to the hospital on that day, I began losing consciousness. I kept praying and promising God that if he let me live, I would do good things with my life. Five hours after I was shot, I finally lost consciousness and was put on life support. Though not visible to most, I still carry countless scars from that day. Over time, I underwent several painful surgeries, but ultimately was left blind in one eye. I still carry more than three dozen bullet fragments in my face and skull and suffer a variety of health issues as a result. Immediately following the attack, I lost my job, my home, my sense of security and my fiance, but gained more than $60,000 in medical bills. Traumatic brain injury, PTSD, surgeries, and making peace with my pain are all issues I continue to contend with. I was not the first victim of my attacker and I was not the last. My shooter Mark Stroman killed two South Asian men during his 9-11 retaliation shooting spree. And Stroman claimed he was hunting Arabs, but not one of his three victims was Middle Eastern. 
He blamed me and my kind for 9-11. And he said, America was no place for Muslims. Mark was tried, convicted, and ultimately sentenced to death by lethal injection. Though I lost a great deal, I did not lose my hope, my dreams, and my faith in God. And I would not and did not give up. I never questioned or and uh, blamed God for what had happened to me. I remember my parents sharing a verse from the Holy Quran, chapter 2, verse 286, that God will never place a burden on a soul that it cannot bear. I remember another verse from my childhood, chapter 94, verse 5 and 6. So verily, with every difficulty, there is relief. Verily, with every difficulty, there is relief. And slowly, relief came. With the mercy of Allah and uh, with the help of many kind and caring Americans, I was eventually able to get my life back on track. And in 2009, I was fortunate enough to go on a religious pilgrimage to Mecca with my mother. It was in Mecca where I kept thinking about my shooting incident. I thought about my shooter sitting on death row waiting to die. And I realized that his life was irrevocably changed because of the shooting, just as mine had been. I deeply felt by executing Mark, we would simply lose a human life without dealing with the root cause. Instead of hating him, I saw Mark as a human being like me, not just a killer. I saw him as a victim too. I suffered terribly, but did not see any value in him suffering as well. My faith, my upbringing gave me the courage and strength not only to forgive Mark, but also fight to save the life of the man who tried to end mine. I returned to the US and with the support of Amnesty International, I began lobbying to save the life of my attacker. I also went to the US Supreme Court asking for clemency. In the meantime, Mark came to know about me and the diverse coalition of Muslims, Christians, Jews, Hindus, and atheists who all rallied together to get him removed from death row. I was told he was stunned and deeply touched by our efforts. This was not something he expected from a Muslim. He thanked the entire Muslim community and called me brother in a phone conversation. He hated me when he didn't know me but in the end said he loved me. Once you get to know the other, it is hard for you to hate them. Allah says in the Holy Quran, chapter 41, verse 34, billati hiya ahsan, which means when people are mean to you, be nice back to them. The person who is your enemy will become your friend. And that is exactly what happened here. Forgiveness and kindness had a transformative effect not only on Mark, but also on his family members who came forward to meet me. Before his execution, Mark declared that hate has to stop. Hate causes a lifetime of pain. Though Mark suffered a life riddled with turmoil and abuse, he ended his life in peace, receiving love and mercy renewing his faith in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and in humanity. I nearly lost my life because of my Islamic faith and the color of my skin, but in the end was treated with respect and accepted as a brother because of my actions inspired by the same Islamic faith. Thank you so very much, dear brother Race. Your story is always so inspiring to me. Uh, you really live out, you have the courage of your convictions uh, and really live it out in such a beautiful and powerful way. Uh, is, this, is this a slide? Can I just, oops. Can you see my? Yep, there you go. 
Okay, great. And you can see this is the verse that you were referencing, Brother Reis, uh, that you truly uh, are a living testament to this verse from the Quran. Uh, because you did become friends with somebody who tried to even end your life. And the amount of courage and inspiration uh, that you, you show, Race, uh, is really so powerful. So thank you for joining us and sharing uh, your story with us. Now, despite the reality of so many individuals and institutions, even Islamic institutions, that in fact live out the Islamic values like race, those are not the stories or narratives that dominate. Instead, there has been a consistent demonizing of Muslims and Islam through media, Hollywood, pop culture, TV shows, and more that present Islam and Muslims as a threat. In fact, according to research from Media Tenor, Islam is the most often mentioned religion in mainstream media, and 80% of that coverage is negative and even defamatory. A study that analyzed the New York Times found that over the course of two, 25 years, the New York Times portrayed Islam and Muslims more negatively than cancer and cocaine. So with this kind of coverage on a daily basis, the fanatic fringes on Fox News, for instance, or in shows like Homeland or 24 become the norm instead of everyday Muslims like me or race or the 3 million other American Muslims in our country. And in fact, contrary to the media's narrative, American Muslims in fact reject violence more than other Americans, according to research by the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. And this is both violence in terms of uh, civilian attacks by the military, you can see the numbers there, and also attacks by individuals or groups. And when it comes to threat, the biggest security threat in our country is not from people who look like me or like race or my parent, you know, my father or my brother, but more often people who look like this. Now, even though statistically, you know, that Newsweek article, that is the headline there, even though statistically the majority of mass violence in our country is committed by white men, most people don't seem to fear white men as a group. According to the FBI, 94% of terror attacks on American soil between 1980 and 2005 were committed by non-Muslims. That's some of the most long-term data available from the FBI. Recent, more recently after that, an investigative report in 2017 analyzed the past nine years and found that most violent extremism in the U.S. comes from the far right, and we in fact compromise security in our nation by focusing so much on Islam. This confirmed prior reports and statistics as well. And then just last week, the Department of Homeland Security also, in their uh, analysis, they also identified white supremacy as the most lethal threat to our country. But facts and stats do not change hearts and minds. People have stereotypes of Muslims and other people of color in a way that they do not have about our white brothers and sisters. Now, I'm not saying all Muslims are only good. There's definitely those that are bad and those that commit violence like any other religious group. And I and Muslims around the world have repeatedly, consistently, and categorically condemned violence by such individuals or groups. And it sickens us when murderers and criminals seek to justify their vile behavior with religion. But the mainstream narrative is written in a way to make certain groups appear to be a greater threat. And this is why some people get labeled the T word with the associated group blame and others who engage in similar action are often described things as lone wolves with mental problems or troubled kids like Dylan Roof, the white supremacist who took the lives of nine African Americans or Stephen Paddock who took the lives of 58 in Las Vegas or Nicholas Cruz of the Florida massacre. None of them were labeled the T word despite their terrorizing actions. And these are for the cases that actually get media attention. There are many others that are not even covered by media. So we have media bias show up both in whether stories are covered and how they are covered, depending on if the perpetrator or victims are Muslim. 
And in fact, I have this video that I'm going to play. I warn you, the volume might be a bit different from my speaking voice, so please be uh, ready to modify your volume if needed. Uh, but this was a study from uh, the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. Let's hope this works. The video. Have you ever felt like some news stories receive a lot more coverage than others of equal importance? You're not imagining it. For example, in 2010, Justin Carl Moose, a self-described Christian counterpart to Osama bin Laden, planned to blow up an abortion clinic. He possessed all the means to make his own explosives, but was exposed by the FBI before actually carrying out his plot. Never heard of Moose? Perhaps that's because his case received little media coverage. Neither the New York Times nor the Washington Post ran a single story about him. For his alleged crime, Moose was sentenced to two and a half years in prison. Compare that case to Antonio Martinez. He was alleged to have acted in the name of Islam when he planned to bomb a military recruitment station outside Baltimore and shoot personnel as they fled the scene. Like Moose, Martinez was also arrested before he had the chance to act on his plot. However, unlike Moose, law enforcement provided Martinez with a fake bomb. Martinez received significantly more media attention. Combined, the New York Times and Washington Post published 10 articles about him. Martinez was charged with planning to use a weapon of mass destruction and was sentenced to 25 years in federal prison. This is not an isolated incident. ISPU's Equal Treatment Report compares the legal and media responses to perpetrators perceived to be Muslim and alleged to be acting in the name of a religious ideology with perpetrators not perceived to be Muslim, allegedly acting in the name of another ideology such as white supremacy. And the differences are striking. Perpetrators perceived to be Muslim received four times the sentencing and 770% more media coverage. And they were seven times more likely to have the weapons supplied by law enforcement than their non-Muslim counterparts. These kinds of disparities misinform the public, fuel suspicion and prejudice, and make us all less safe. Equal conduct should receive equal treatment. Check out all of ISPU's findings in our report Equal Treatment? Measuring the Legal and Media Responses to Ideologically Motivated Violence in the United States at www.ispu.org slash equal treatment. So that, uh, that kind of disparate treatment, let's say, contributes to people's perceptions of who is a threat in our country. And a clear result of this narrative problem is a Washington Times media headline reporting on a study that came out of Duke and the University of North Carolina. Now that study, like other studies, found that the majority of fatalities in terms of domestic terrorism were at the hands of white national extremists, not Muslims. But the headline of this article was, majority of fatal attacks on US soil carried out by white supremacists, not terrorists. Let that sink in for a minute. It is almost by definition that we have reserved the T word for a specific group. So you see why that word has become and is used as an anti-Muslim slur even, and also why this meme from Family Guy seems to be appropriate. Now friends, we are able to differentiate one violent Christian criminal from the religion because we know enough about Christianity and Christians to not fear all of Christianity or all Christians when one does something bad. Imagine if all we heard about Christianity were the Dylan Roofs and KKKs of the world. And imagine we combined that with certain violent verses of the Bible taken out of context, like Luke 19.27, where Jesus is quoted as saying, but those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them bring them here and kill them in front of me. Or Matthew 10, 34, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. That gives you a sense of what's happening with the Quran, Muslims, and Islam in our country. That is Islamophobia. 
Now, just to clarify, that out-of-context quote from Luke 19.27 is from a parable, and I know that Jesus, peace be upon him, did not teach hate or killing. He taught and embodied love. And he quoted the Torah when he said that the greatest commandments are loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. Muslims believe in these love teachings of Jesus, and they were also taught by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him who taught us that you cannot have faith without loving each other. That love really is a core essence of our faith. I also know that Christianity does not teach hate or killing, despite many of examples of people who may hate or may have killed even in the name of Christianity, because I've learned Christianity from Christians, not anti-Christians. Unfortunately, most of our fellow Americans have learned Islam not from Muslims, but from anti-Muslims. And that is the problem. There is that well-funded infrastructure that promotes and profits off of this campaign of misinformation and manipulation. That's the Islamophobia industry that, again, we discussed last week. And it's important to recognize that Islamophobia is a continuation of the same narrative of fear, scapegoating, and otherization that's been used against minority communities here at home and abroad throughout history. The narrative and the script are very similar. You just got to change the characters and the labels. And that's how the word terrorist gets used the same way that another T word, thug, has been used in a different script, for instance, to demonize, criminalize, and terrorize entire communities. And it's a tool that is weaponized and used to win elections and a tool to divide we, the people. But these tools of oppression only work if we allow them to. We, in fact, we, the people, do have a choice and the power to prevent this kind of manipulation, misinformation, and fear-mongering. And that's what this whole Facts Over Fear campaign is about. Because regardless of our faith or no faith backgrounds, we all have more in common with each other than any of us do with certain fringe elements of our own faith or wisdom traditions or those haters who seek to destroy or hurt others. We should be uniting and standing against all harm against any of us, recognizing how much our liberation our safety, our security, and our well-being is actually connected. Together, we actually can promote a different narrative from the one by the Islamophobia industry that in fact hurts all of us as Americans. We can promote facts over fear. We can choose love over hate. And we can commit to our pledge of one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And now I'm going to so pass it over. Just, Go ahead. Yeah, so I just really appreciated what you shared today, Anila. And um, I'm going to share the screen here now for a minute and, and, and respond just a little bit um, with, uh, first of all, a Christian perspective on, um, on the, 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 the issue of jihad or, or struggle. And I just want to start off uh, with this, that, um, that the Abrahamic traditions, of which Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are all part, uh, essentially have two core ideas. Uh, one is to love God more than our tribe and traditions. So we love God more than anything. And because God is the creator of all, then we're, we have an expanded imagination for who we are to love. And then we are also to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And, uh, and so this is the core of the tradition. And this core of the tradition exists in lots of ways because the world uh, that we experience is not the way God might want it to be. And it's not the way we might hope it could be. And, and also we know that, that we ourselves have growth, have things we have to challenge about ourselves before we can be the, the kind of people who could help make that world a better place. And so, and so the Abrahamic traditions center us on this love of God more than tribe and tradition and loving our neighbors, we love ourselves. And Islam, Christianity, and Judaism share this and share this idea that it takes effort 
that it takes work, it takes risk in order to be able to help create the world that God is envisioning. So um, it, within the Christian faith, uh, we talk about jihad and the Christian faith. We're really talking about a couple of things, uh, effort, work, striving, but also kind of a deep sense of commitment. We're talking about character development, like becoming the kind of person that God is calling us to be, and then working actively for justice and peace in society, all of which takes work and effort and striving and commitment. And so in terms of total commitment, Jesus was very clear, right? He said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. So this is Jesus taking a, a, um, a tool of, of terror, uh, a tool of state terror in, in the first century, and basically saying that, that, um, that he was going to take it on in such a way that it was emptied of its power, so that other people could then begin to live out God's vision right there in the midst of the Roman Empire. Um, we have throughout the scripture lots of examples of of Christians being encouraged to strive for good character. Here is one example from 2 Peter. Followers of Christ make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly and sisterly kindness, and to sibling kindness love. So there is throughout the Christian scriptures this idea that that all of us have to work and risk and have commitment to work on ourselves so that we can, as Gandhi talked about, be the change that we'd like to see in the world. We're also encouraged in the Christian scriptures from the very beginning of Jesus' uh, ministry, certainly, um, to strive for peace and justice. As Jesus talked about, repent, uh, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe in the good news. He was essentially announcing that we don't have to live by the Roman way of dominating people and belittling people and using people um, economically and otherwise, um, that we could in fact begin to live a different kind of life. And so in Ephesians chapter six, uh, you know, the writer says, for our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers and authorities and against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Basically, what we're talking about here is we're not to struggle for peace and justice against people, but against the kind of um, spirituality, against the worldview, against the larger culture that seeks to divide us from one another. And so we want to be very clear, it's not against people, it's against the things uh, and the, 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 the worldviews and the attitudes that are sort of capturing people and making them do things that aren't working for peace. And so as I've been thinking about jihad in general, and also, you know, the whole notion of submission in Islam, I, I think about baptism, not, not to make them both the same exactly, but in baptism, we, we trust fully the creator of the universe and that that creator loves us and is kind and compassionate to us. And at the same time in Christian baptism, there's a notion of daily change, which, uh, which is so challenging, requires so much struggle that it actually feels like dying sometimes. And so in Romans chapter 6, you know, Paul writes that we've been buried with Christ in baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised, we too can be raised in newness of life. And so this sort of notion of, of submission, but also of struggle in, in Islam, is very similar to the, to the notion of Christian baptism, even, even though it's different. And so what we got to recognize, though, and certainly acknowledge, is that throughout the Christian history, um, Jesus' teachings about loving God, loving neighbor, loving all our neighbors, everyone on the planet, the planet Earth, no matter what culture or religion they're from, and, um, and also loving enemy, loving our enemies, um, that that teaching, that struggle that Jesus was inviting us into, has often been undone or at least ignored um, or contradicted by some Christian leaders. For instance, Pope Nicholas in 1452 said we, and he said this to, uh, to the, the kings and queens in, in Spain at the time, the Christian kings, we grant you by these present documents with our apostolic authority, supposedly coming from Jesus, 
full and free permission to invade, search out, capture, subjugate the Muslims and the pagans and any other unbelievers and enemies of Christ, wherever they may be, as well as their kingdoms, duchies, counties, principalities, and other property, and to reduce their persons to perpetual servitude. That teaching falls way short, is nowhere near the teaching of Jesus. Uh, just as, uh, as, as, as the word uh, infidel was created, uh, basically uh, out of Latin, the word lacking faith, uh, infidel, um, was applied uh, by, by some European Catholic kings uh, in the 13th century to justify uh, the Crusades. So we have here a justification to violence against those who aren't Christian. This is, falls so far short of Jesus' teachings. And what I feel has happened is that we've applied some of the, the distortions of the Christian faith that I think Jesus would have a serious problem with, right? Um, that we've applied some of those distortions and projected them onto Islam when they don't belong there. And they don't belong, I, I need to say, to any, either faith. So one of the things that we have to recognize is that the prophet Muhammad uh, lived in a very different kind of situation than Jesus did. The prophet Muhammad didn't live under the Roman Empire. He lived in a, in a kind of a, a wild west sort of a, an area. And he actually became a leader of a city. Um, he had responsibility for, for all the souls and the people there. And he was given that authority by the people themselves. And so he really had to do something that Jesus never had to do. Jesus was never the, the mayor of Capernaum or Nazareth, right? And so... And so he lived 24,000 days. Of those 24,000 days, he only engaged in armed conflict on six of those days. And how many of those days were in like offense trying to hurt people? Well, zero. And so we have this impression, we're told the story that those six days tell the whole story. And we don't even tell those six days right because don't we all agree that if you're a nation state or uh, that you have the right to defend yourself if you're being attacked. And that's what was happening uh, to the prophet Muhammad and to all of his people in Medina. And so we just aren't telling the story fairly. And so um, I want to take us back now and, and start, to tar start to talk about some messaging and, and how we can do well as allies uh, and, and, and even as, um, as just friends of Muslims. So I want to remind us about the, the, the challenge of dangerous speech and mass violence. So what Anila was describing today really was, in lots of ways, the work of dangerous speech around the topic of Islam and peace and how it's working uh, to really tell lies, to bear false witness against our Muslim neighbors. And so the way dangerous speech works always is to propose an us and a them, to begin to dehumanize the group that, that is, that is the, the them, and to apply collective blame. So if one person in that group does something, we blame the entire group. But like I said last week, not all Lutherans were blamed for Dylan Roof, nor should they be. A collective blame is just wrong. And that begins to develop a kind of sense of threat. And the problem is that the fear becomes real, even when the threat isn't. And it leads to this idea that violence is necessary and even good, even morally good and a peaceful future awaits if we begin to enact that violence now. And that is kind of where we're at here. So when we start to think about friends and neighbors that we have, people in our, in what our faith community we're part of, and civic groups and political clubs, we have some challenges that we have to think about clearly in order to be able to overcome this. And that first one is fear. And so what I want you to remember is that people fear on the basis of that which they love. So if they're angry about Islam and, and, and what they perceive to be its treatment of women, well, you need to come alongside that fear with people. You need to recognize that that fear is deep and fear takes a long time to work through. And so we have to be patient. Second is that most people don't make logical like assessments of the world and, and then get feelings about them. Most people actually have intuitions that lead them to make decisions. And then we spend our rationality and our logic defending our moral intuition. And again, that's a very deep process and it takes a lot of time to overcome. So it doesn't always work to just to talk logic to people. 
Thirdly, that human beings are pretty good at defending our position once we've achieved it by either fear that's been generated in us or by the moral intuitions that we sort of have. So we have confirmation bias. We accept information that, that, that uh, uh, affirms our position and we sort of repel information or ignore information that doesn't. And of course, social media is making this worse. Our, our fractured media system out there is making this worse, where we can basically you know, get on YouTube and never hear information or on Facebook, never hear information that's different from our point of view. And then lastly, what's happening more and more in our culture, in our country, is we're having a lot of challenges with in-group, out-group thinking. And of course, it's the fall political season right now. And so what's happened is that human beings, like we love, uh, we absolutely love to have teams. Uh, that's, that's why pro football is back, right? Um, and so um, we have a lot of in-group, out-group dynamic where sometimes we just get reactive and we want to, uh, to defend our team, even if our team happens to be wrong. And then we get into scapegoating. You know, all, we're, we're, we're anxious and we've got a lot of challenges and, and we got to find somebody to blame, right? And we certainly have an anxious society right now. So when you start to think about how you can be an ally for our Muslim neighbors, we want to encourage you to think carefully about your audience. And what we see here in this chart is that there's a certain number of folk that are kind of part of our choir, right? They know how to sing. They know how to sing in public. They know how to help stand with their Muslim neighbors. And then we have people that really are with us. They may not know everything but they, they understand that what's happening to our Muslim neighbors is wrong and they have some capacity to work against that. But what we often do when we see these kind of situations where hate and fear are being generated is that we, uh, we really want to, um, to, to change the opposition. Like we, we wanna make them change their mind and we spend so much energy on our opposition that we forget that our opposition because of confirmation bias and all the things I mentioned earlier are not likely to change very easily, we then forget the group that we need to focus on the most, and that is persuadable people. So you have people around a Thanksgiving table, one of whom may be part of the opposition, may think Muslims are so terrible, and may say things about that. When you respond to that person, don't respond to that person. Respond in a way that opens up the door for people around the table. And so some just basics that we're going to go through, and we'll go through this in much more detail in our next webinar, is we just want you to focus on kind of three things in kind of an order. And the first two are, are by far the most powerful, but the third's important too. And the first one is shared values. So I told you a story last week about, about a gentleman who was angry about what he perceived to be Islam's treatment of women, what it teaches about women. And I was able to affirm his values with him. That, that, that how we treat women as a society is very important to me. Um, and that it's, and I began to help him understand that it's important to Islam and to Muslims as well. And then I began to share with him some positive stories about Islam and women, which he had never heard before. And then lastly, I shared with him some information like from the Institute of Social Policy and Understanding about Islam and women and how is, is, uh, Muslim women have very high levels of education in this country. And, and all of that together really worked to help him. And so what's important to understand as we do that kind of messaging, that kind of careful, thoughtful approach to people, is that in terms of a change process, three things are really powerful. First one is relationships with Muslims themselves. The problem is that Muslims make up only 1% of the population. So how can every Muslim have 100 best friends? It just doesn't work. But still, relationships with Muslims, experiences in mosques and Islamic centers are really, really powerful. Number two, they can relate through you, through allies who know Muslims, who've been to a mosque, who've, who've gotten to understand Islam and Muslims a bit better. And you can help really just by your very presence and by your willingness to state that positive stories about your Muslim neighbor, the shared values that they share with all of us as human beings, as people of faith, and or as, uh, as American citizens. Uh, but, but the next one is also really powerful, is providing opportunities for Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus and Jews and Christians and atheists and agnostics to work for the common good together. And that is by far uh, the most powerful way, relationships 
allies working together and working for the common good that can really help uh, change the situation and help us all recognize each other as human beings. Uh, because of course, that's, that's what this is all about. So I wanna open it up now for Anila to respond to anything I said, and then in a few minutes, we'll have some time for some questions. Yes, thank you so much, dear brother Terry. I, I will reiterate to folks, if you have questions, please use the Q&A feature. You can go ahead and type in your questions there and we will try to address them and get to as many as we can. Uh, I'll just also point out, you know, Reverend Terry mentioned uh, uh, women and Islam, and that's actually the topic of next week's discussion. And we're gonna be honored to have three, uh, two special guests with us, uh, a reverend and a rabbi who together with me, we, we call ourselves the Daughters of Abraham. So we're very honored to have Reverend uh, uh, Dr. Kelly Brown and Rabbi Johanna Kinberg, who will be joining us. Uh, so don't forget to tune in next week at 4 p.m. Uh, but for now, I wanted to just add to sort of what Reverend Terry was saying is the importance of those personal relationships and the stories that even if not all of us can have personal relationships, we can work with each other to help develop these or share these uh, personal stories, actual personalizing, humanizing stories, because that is far more effective in changing hearts and minds than all the stats and data that we might be able to, to share. I have a lot of the stats and the data you may or may not and it's okay if you don't. All you got to do is share your stories. And this is why I tell people, like, if you hear people making anti-Muslim comments, especially someplace like Terry mentioned at, you know, over Thanksgiving meal, for instance, you don't want to debate them. You don't want to go into sort of the Quran says this or that. That's not going to help. People will further dig in if you challenge them that way directly. Instead, it's far better to say something like, you know what? That's not true. Let me tell you about the Muslims I know and just go into stories about the Muslims you know. And if you don't know Muslims, then hopefully you can make friends or connect with others who do. And it's really about those relationships and personal stories that we can help affect change according to research even. So that's the approach that we strongly emphasize. And that's also where we uh, you know, rely heavily on all of you as our friends and our allies to stand with us and share some of those stories. And you can do so not just in person, but also through your social media instead of sharing negative stories, or even if you're going to deny them, even if you're going to challenge them, instead of responding to all the attacks on social media about Islam and Muslims, ignore those. Ignore the haters, as the Quran teaches us, essentially, right? We can ignore the haters and just uplift the positive messages, the positive stories. That is a much more effective way to help create some kind of change. So I'll, I'll stop there. I have a lot more to share, but I'll stop there so we can address uh, one of the questions that we have here. Oh, go ahead, Terry. Well, I was just going to say, you know, you've now heard a really positive story today from our brother Rakes, right? So that's a story that you can tell. And, uh, and there, are, there are so many other positive stories out there. So if you're in a part of the country where there's not a lot of Muslims, well, you can do some reading and, and begin, to, uh, begin to, to learn some of those real life, you know, American stories, but stories across the world. Because, and remember that when you tell that story, the change isn't going to happen right away. That, 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 change, that story will kind of roll around in people's heads and hearts for a while. And maybe the following Thanksgiving, you'll begin to see some fruit from that. So we just want to really encourage you to patience and not to try to change people's mind, but really share your experience and your story and, and your values, uh, your positive American values about religious liberty, religious freedom, um, the, the protection of everyone's rights in this nation. Um, so uh, whether or not you're a religious person or not. So uh, Anila, go ahead and uh, begin to respond to the, one of the questions. And we just want to encourage all of you, if you have a question for us, we, we really want to hear them. So please type that in the Q&A. Yeah, I, I think, Race, did you want to share something? I thought I saw your unmute go off. Well, you know, I mean, uh, as Brother Terry was talking about sharing stories, story is powerful, you know, because we all know uh, about the textbook definition of racism, you know, uh, sexism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, we all know the text, you know, textbook definition, but we would never know what it feels like to be a victim or to go through trauma and you know, living in fear of thinking you are the next. So unless we, we share our you know, unique stories, you know, we would never know what it feels like to live, you know, to live like that. And the story has power because it is easy to tell people, oh, just forgive or be hopeful, I'll yeah, get it over. But instead of saying, if you, since you're talking about in the religion, if you look at all the, all the scriptures, it's full of stories, stories of Noah, Joseph, you know, um, Jonah, Prophet Muhammad, uh, you know, peace be upon all of them, 
is full of stories because God wanted to teach us all those human qualities through his stories. Instead of telling, don't be ugly, don't be doing this and that, he talked about a lot of his stories. So that's what we can do. We can share our stories. And if you don't have stories to share from our personal experience, at least we can share someone else's story in hopes of making a positive difference. Thank, thank you so much, Ray, for that. So now we'll go ahead and turn to the questions. Uh, the first one is from Paul asking about, you know, this uh, quoting, uh, defend ourselves or turn the other cheek. So I'll address that briefly. I think that this came in uh, by, based on what you were saying, Terry. So we'll give you a chance to respond as well. And Race, of course, uh, weigh in if you wanted to. And I'll say specifically uh, that in the Quran, there is a verse in chapter 5, verse 45, that specifically talks about the idea that exists in the Bible, too, of sort of an eye for an eye. And that idea is essentially to limit any kind of revenge or retaliation, like to not exceed any kind of boundaries. But the Quran specifically says in this verse that if you are able to forgive, you know, that you, if you are able to forego sort of this sense of uh, getting revenge or anything else like that, uh, that that is far better. And it's actually an, uh, a way to reduce your own sins and earn reward from God. And I also want to be very clear that Islamically, and I believe also biblically, the idea is that this uh, sort of uh, an eye for an eye even, that that is limited after, uh, not, not just in terms of the, the actual, uh, you know, uh, equ uh, equivalency there, but also after an actual you know, trial or judgment or finding of guilt, some kind of due process that is required before that. But I think in, in somebody like race, we have a beautiful example of what somebody can choose to say, you know what, I'm going to forgive this person. I have the right to be mad at them. I have the right to sort of insist that they go ahead and get the death penalty based on what they did in killing others. But you know what, I'm going to choose forgiveness instead. And that's really living out this sort of uh, Quranic verse about forgiveness being far better. And that's a way to expiate your own sins. And it's a form of charity, in fact. Yeah, so this, uh, the issue of Jesus, uh, when he talks about turning the other cheek, uh, loving your enemy, uh, it, we, we really have to understand a couple of things. Uh, first is that, again, Jesus is operating inside of, uh, uh, of a, a Palestine at the time occupied by the Roman army. And, uh, and so um, there, was, there was in Jesus' apparent estimation no way for, for them to be able to use military force against the Roman Empire at all because it would just, they would just get crushed. And so Jesus advocates for an active nonviolent strategy. Um, his, his taking on the cross was part of that. And so when he talks about, about uh, turning the other cheek, it's really important for us to understand what that meant. Turning the other cheek is not allowing someone to beat you up. Actually, not at all. Um, so in that century, when you would be slapped in the Mediterranean world, when you would be like uh, slapped by someone who's your superior, you'd be slapped by the back of your hand. And that was their way of putting you in your place and saying that you are a lesser human being. You're lower in the caste system than the person striking you. And so when Jesus says, turn the other cheek, well, what would have happened is the person who struck you, their hand would go over here and now the, the palm of their hand is facing you. And that's what you would use if an equal uh, offended you and you would, you would uh, slap them across the face, probably not that hard actually, um, to let them know that they had offended you. And so turning the cheek was a way to claim mutuality, to claim your own humanity, to claim your own equality before God with the other person. It was a way to resist an unjust societal system. It was a way, it was a strategy for going uh, to, um, uh, you know, for, for using nonviolent means to, to uh, expose the injustice of the larger social system. And so it's a very complex thing Jesus is talking about there, and it's not the same thing as just allowing people to beat you up or take you over. And, uh, but there is this incredible difference between Jesus, who was leading a movement, and the prophet Muhammad that was in charge of a city, who had children in there, and who was being brutally uh, advanced upon by the, by the Qureshi who were, who were from Mecca. And so I just think we have to have some recognition of the difference of those contexts here. There is plenty in the Quran, in the Prophet Muhammad's life, of working for peace, of putting up with all kinds of folk being mean to you so that you can work for peace, even when they're cruel to you, as we see in our brother Race's story. 
And so I just, we just have to keep understanding that, that, that each of the major scriptures has many different socioeconomical, uh, cultural contexts, and we have to take those stories within those contexts to be able to understand them very well. If I may say just one uh, word. Oh, yes, please. Just one word that, you know, um, eye for an eye is not, not the option, it's one of the options. And anytime, you know, I can, I can only speak about Quran, I don't have much knowledge about Bible since, but if Terry is there, he can chime in. But anywhere it talks about punishment in the Quran, it also talks about forgiveness, mercy, and other options as well. And, my, and from my personal experience, I would say that, that sometimes, you know, a revenge may, you know, uh, revenge may, you know uh, you may feel revenge, you know, that revenge, is, revenge may sounds like, you know, sweet, or even you may feel revenge is sweet, but God's mercy is sweeter. That's what I learned from my experience. So we, we want to next take on a, a question from Juliana here, who is talking about um, about Islamic countries and and you know how do we interpret it or understand it when when they use warfare in their in their nation states, and so I just want to start this off briefly by 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 reminding us that that the United States of America is majority Christian. So do we blame Jesus? for every military decision made by the United States of America? I, I would hope not. So nation states kind of do what nation states do, depending on what they perceive to be in their self-interest at the time, often irrespective of the majority religion of the country, right? And so I just want to help us understand and, and constantly work on a distinction between the minority religious folk of a particular country and the actions of a nation state um, that may or may not be uh, uh, working in a, in a very thoughtful or democratic way, <laughs> may not represent the will and intentions of their people very well. And so, uh, I, so I just want to challenge the, the, the perception uh, that, that we blame uh, majority Muslim countries for, for their aggression or their military activities, but maybe we don't look so much to ours. Uh, George W. Bush uh, said that, that you know, we often uh, blame, you know, see the worst in others, but while at the same time claiming our own best intentions, seeing ourselves through those, those best intentions. And so Jesus was pretty clear about this too, that uh, when he talked about uh, taking the log out of our own eye before we take the speck out of someone else's. And so it's just important for us to differentiate between the minority of religion and between the actions of nation states and not see them as the same thing. Yeah, and I think you did a great job, Reverend Terry, answering uh, Juliana's question. I would just point out too the, the piece that you shared with us during your presentation, which was specifically from the Pope. Uh, mm -hmm. That language even came from a religious leader. And yet, hopefully today at least, none of us would look at that and say, that's what Jesus taught. And I think that's the important distinction that we're really needing to do with Islam and Muslims, the very same way we do it with Christianity and Christians, is to just recognize that individuals and also individual nation states may act in their self-interest and seek to justify their behavior with religion and exploit religion when it's in their interest because they know the power of religion. Religious scripture is so powerful and people recognize that power and therefore try to exploit it for their benefit. And we see that happen all the time. And I say this a lot too, just about religious scripture in general, is that it's kind of, to me at least, I see it as a mirror. That religious scripture really is a mirror of your own heart. So if you open up you know, the Quran or, or the Bible and you start reading all this horrible stuff and try to find justification for your horrible actions, well, that's your heart. That's not the religion. You know, that's a problem with, with you, very likely, not so much the religion. And I think that's what I would like to, uh, to have more of us sort of recognize and be able to, uh, to see in, in even the uh, questions that we ask and, and the kinds of decisions that we make and the judgments that we draw. There also was a question about uh, whether there are any online streaming services from uh, Islamic centers or mosques at this time that are open to guests. And I did respond to this in writing, but I just want to share it with others as well. And that is that the Muslim Association of Puget Sound, uh, MAPS, which is based in Redmond, it's the largest Islamic center in the state of Washington. Uh, MAPS uh, does have virtual services right now for our Friday services. That's our day of service. So Friday afternoons at 1 p.m 
program, you can log on, you can follow it at the Facebook page and see the live stream there. Uh, you can join the Zoom if you go to the website. I put the website's address there, uh, but I'll also send it in the chat as well so everybody has that. So you're absolutely welcome to join us for that. If you live in a different state, uh, let us know in the chat and we'll all, I'll find a mosque that has a local service potentially uh, for you as well uh, that you could follow along with. It's a great way to actually hear the message directly from Muslims instead of, again, what the haters will share. And on that point about the haters, keep something else in mind. If you just Google something into, uh, if you just type something into Google, the majority of material you're likely going to get about Islam is likely going to come from the haters or the, you know, the, those opponents or uh, others. Uh, uh, so keep that in mind as well. Please make sure you're finding reputable sources when you try to find more information about Islam or Muslims. I just want to remind everybody that there's, there's no tradition on the planet, I don't think, that, that hasn't had some kind of usage uh, by the powerful, especially, to justify their economic or, or political kind of um, uh, decisions. And, uh, and it's always a, a shame. It's one of the biggest challenges that we, that we really face um, around the world. It's important to note, though, that quite a few studies have been done, one by the BBC, another one in a book I have behind me here um, that, that has looked at the, at the way religion plays a role in nation state violence. And what they found was that one study found that about 15% of the time, another study said about 40% of the time, religion played some role in the, in the generation of the violence. But, but often they said, often in a pretty minor way. What it often does is provides kind of a permission structure for people within their religion to say, well, hey, it's okay if we go ahead and do this. And that goes directly against the, the great tradition of the, of the Abrahamic tradition of, of the, the work of a prophet or the work of a truth teller. So we just want to, want to it, always encourage your faith leaders, uh, if you happen to be part of one, and if you are a faith leader yourself, uh, be willing to take that risk and, and don't allow our, our various religious traditions. Like right now, there's a Buddhist, there's, there's some Buddhist traditions being used uh, for justification against violence in Myanmar. And that's not Buddhist teaching. That's not what most Buddhists believe at all. Um, so, so all around the world, just, uh, uh, religions have been distorted, including a by like the, the Lord's Liberation Army in, in, in Africa. Uh, claiming that Jesus is all behind violence. Well, that's just not true either. So we have to extend that same courtesy to our Muslim neighbors and our Buddhist neighbors as we do to Christian neighbors. Yep, and that actually brings us to the end of our time together. Uh, we so appreciate all of you joining us uh, from wherever you are. We hope you will continue this journey with us with next week. As I mentioned, it's going to be about Islam and women, and we're going to have two guest speakers with us. Uh, we're excited to have that conversation and really address a lot of the misinformation out there about Islam and women and find out why I actually personally chose Islam for myself uh, in large part because of what it teaches about women's rights. So so tune in, join us for that next week. Uh, and then also, if you missed last week, again, you can catch it on the Facebook page for Facts Over Fear. You can also find it, I understand Ian is going to upload it to our YouTube channel and put it on the website as well later today. So thank you so very much, everybody, for joining us. Terry, go ahead. Did you have something? Yeah, I just want to say thanks again to Race for joining us. And if you want to learn more about Race's work uh, uh, with Jessica, it's at worldwithouthate.org. And they just do really incredible work. And we're so thankful uh, to, to call you brother and to partner with you, Race. Likewise. Thank you, Brother Terry. And thank you, Sister Yes. So thank you, until brother. Next... Hope you all have a great week. Yes. Until next week, we'll follow up then. Uh, in the meantime, go Hawks. So thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> go see Hawks. I, I'm still a huge fan. So all right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> have a wonderful evening. They're thank playing you. now. <laughs>